What's up guys, it's Kaze here. So I wanted to take a look back at WWE's One Night Stand in 2007. It's a super random pay-per-view to take a look back at, but at the same time for me, it had a lot of significance. I used to sleep over at my cousin's house in the summer of 2007, and we had this pay-per-view on some type of bootleg tape, and the tape was of pretty decent quality, like, you saw everybody's faces. It wasn't like a super blurry bootleg tape that you'd get from your guy at your local Herald's Chicken. So for the most part, we were pretty down for it. I was about, I want to say 10 years old at the time, maybe 11. And we were like the biggest Hardy Boy fans. And this pay-per-view had them. So we were just always hyped for that. Um, looking back at it as an adult, it's not what I always held near and dear to my heart. So um, I thought we could just go ahead and take a, a quick look at this. It's, it's a pretty crazy pay-per-view. So the pay-per-view starts off with a bunch of fireworks and such, and I honestly forgot just the aesthetic of these 2000s pay-per-views. Like, it's just super hardcore, and I get it's an ECW pay-per-view, but just aside from that, you, you see the crowd, and it's like, everybody just wants to see something super cool. And it's not too far off from what you see now, but like nowadays you see like a lot more families in the crowd and things of that nature. And tonight, it was just not that. The first match that we have was Randy Orton versus RVD in a stretcher match. Now, Randy Orton was kind of fresh off of his rated RKO run. He had recently punt kicked Shawn Michaels into oblivion and going around saying that he ended the career of Shawn Michaels. Uh, and I remember this time and I was a huge Shawn Michaels fan. so. I could not stand Randy Orton, like, with a passion. He was just like, he was probably the biggest heel to me, and I, I probably would put him over edge at that point in time. So it's Orton against Rob Van Dam, and we loved Rob Van Dam growing up. He was, like, probably one of the top five baby faces that I could probably name of the 2000s era, in my opinion. So if you remember around this time, these two guys had a match on Raw and it ended with Randy Orton giving RVD one of the most brutal RKO's I've ever seen in my life. Like this was no joke. RVD landed on like the side of his head and neck. It was it was pretty brutal. Um, and RVD was kayfabe out with a concussion. I'm not quite sure what the details were. I'll put it up on the screen if I find out. Um, so this was RVD's big return. And it was kind of a pretty heated rivalry at this point. So these guys start off pretty, pretty even and actually pretty standard for such a heated rivalry i believe but at the same time that could just be nostalgia kicking in so rvd does an insane senton over the ropes onto the stretcher and his leg kind of clipped the stretcher before he hit the ground and it just looked pretty brutal he was fine to be honest watching this as a kid i was like just super hyped for the spots happening I wasn't necessarily focused on the storytelling going on in the match. Seeing it now, it's it was pretty like obvious how hard they were pushing Randy Orton and seeing him like take out Shawn Michaels and then focus on RVD and then to see what he did further down in the future. It was pretty obvious that this was probably the start of that. This was definitely the start of that, especially in 2007. I believe he won the WWE Championship later on that year. So the match ends with RVD actually winning. And I I don't remember him winning as a kid. 
like i was actually pretty shocked that he won the match watching this as an adult and um this is why yeah so in this moment i realized this might be why they do after match attacks because in the moment we're gonna remember that rvd won but like in the long run we're gonna remember that randy orton came out on top at least in the closing moments like this entire time i thought randy orton won because i remember him kicking rvd into oblivion also for a future video i think i'm gonna do all the times that randy orton punk kicked people and they returned to kick his ass i think that'd just be a great thing to compile he's kicked some great people in the past like it's it's actually pretty crazy so i think it'd be a great thing to cover so they cut to backstage after the match to vince mcmahon talking to shane mcmahon and this is vince mcmahon just a few weeks after do-rag vince like he just stopped wearing the do-rag because his hair grew back but like you know what actually i we're gonna cover do-rag vince in a later time but in this promo he was saying um he felt something eating at him, like something bad was gonna happen to him. And he was real anxious. He even described it as a cancerous feeling. And about eight days later, this happened. And then about two weeks later, this happened. So in the next match we had ECW original Sandman and Tommy Dreamer and CM Punk versus Matt Stryker, Elijah Burke, and Marcus Corvon. And this is gonna be a six man tag team table match. And yes, a tag team table match for some reason. Yeah, for some reason, the match started off with everybody tagging in and just kind of like chain wrestling. It was a little weird for this to be like a tables match. By the way, Sandman was bleeding before the match from hitting his face with a can. I know that's nothing new, but it's something to note. So for the most part, I thought this match was gonna be like a little bit more extreme. And I actually hate calling this a ECW pay-per-view because by this time it was clearly WWE. But this was pretty clunky and i'm not trying to be harsh on these guys by any means i understand it's especially in a tables match like they're putting their bodies out there like i super understand but at the same time like the the chemistry was off it's not even really like the choice of spots it was more so the chemistry and the choice of wrestlers selected for the match i feel it was just something off like they were missing timing on spots and stuff like that. And I understand like that happens. So I'm, I'm not even trying to be too harsh. So this was like a pretty standard match. There was no real notable spot. Um, CM Punk suplex Matt Stryker through the table to win the match. That was a pretty cool spot. But other than that, it was um just a little let down. That's all. So after the match, we have Edge getting ready for his match versus Batista later that night. Now, we're gonna get to the reason why I was shocked that Edge had a match that night, just a little bit later. So Randy Orton enters the frame and he's all smug and he's doing that thing he does where he's bragging about ending Shawn Michaels' career. And so I guess the draft is actually coming up soon and Randy is pretty much saying if he's drafted to SmackDown, he's going for that championship. It never happened. Also, side note, Randy Orton was partners with Edge and also partners with his opponent tonight, Batista. They could have done something with that. They could have done something with that. So the next match we have the Hardys versus the world's greatest tag team, Charlie Haas and Sheldon Benjamin. Yeah. Um, this was a slightly worse match than I remembered, but again, this was a child watching it versus an adult, so I won't be too hard on the match. But at the same time, um, the chemistry, again, just wasn't there with these guys. Like, they were kind of late on spots a lot of times. Uh, Charlie Haas did this weird thing where he was setting up the ladder, and he kind of 
set it up wrong the first time and i guess he was the the spot was he was gonna make a ladder bridge between the apron and another ladder standing um like on the ramp and one of the ladder he was using was pretty short just throughout the whole match they were using like pretty short ladders don't know where they were getting them especially like this is wwe where like their ladders are usually like 20 foot tall so i don't know where they were getting these like 15 foot tall ladders but they were not doing the match justice at all sheldon benjamin tries to climb in the ring he tries to do his signature off the top rope onto the ladder climb up punch the guy but um he completely slips does a front flip kicks over the ladder and knocks jeff off it looked kind of intentional but it also looked like it hurt both of them so after this there's a lot of painful ladder hits actually like i'm not even gonna lie like these guys did not look like they were okay after the match none of them the final spot comes where i believe they kind of messed up a bit um like i said before they were using super small ladders and i guess the final spot was for the hardys to knock haas and benjamin off of the ladder that they were standing on they were all standing on their perspective ladders both teams um so the hardys get knocked off of theirs land on their feet and they're pushing haas and benjamin off of their ladders the ladder's too short and there is a bridge ladder between the apron and the barricade on the hard cam so they're presumably supposed to go through that ladder hoss completely misses the top rope and still lands in the ring and benjamin poor guy lands all the way to the floor clipping the ladder just a little bit not enough to break it but it looks super painful like poor guy man he's all right though all in all this was still a good match it was a fun time it was completely different than what i remember but i still enjoyed re-watching it like i got the boost of nostalgia that i was looking for and this match was it, was it was what i needed okay so the next match we have was kane versus mark henry in a lumberjack match and i'll be honest i kind of was not into this match at all and I hope I don't sound like I'm just being negative on all the matches. But you gotta hear me out on this one. This match was Mark Henry targeting Kane's back. Thus putting him in a bear hug for most of the match. Why were there lumberjacks? This didn't make any sense to me. I, I just, I couldn't get into it. The only thing I have in my notes is lol remember kenny dykstra and then below that i have michael cole calls mark henry thick and says he has a big back i wouldn't write that if it didn't happen by the way mark henry wins via bear hug man so the hardys hoss and benjamin are backstage nursing their wounds and i guess it's not over because they just got to fighting again man I just don't believe they had the chemistry. I was never a huge fan of this rivalry. Like, granted, they had some cool matches, but like, what was ever their feud about? Let me know in the comments. So the next match we have Vince McMahon versus Bobby Lashley, and it's a street fight. And Vince has Shane in his corner. And also Umaga. Now, if you remember this saga, going back from Wrestlemania actually a little bit before but this was kind of Wrestlemania was kind of the climax of it all pause um so Vince gets shaved bald he's do-rag Vince I'm actually gonna do a video on do-rag Vince and the terror he caused because that was insane and he's still holding the ECW championship at this point mind you this is a ecw quote unquote pay-per-view now this match was actually pretty fun it was it was like pretty high pace from the get-go bobby lashley starts off by jumping over the top rope and 
mostly missing Umaga and just kind of like hitting him with his foot and hitting the ground. Like it was kind of crazy to just see in the first second of the match. After that, he focuses on Shane, takes him out. So then he turns his attention to Vince and he gets some pretty good shots in on Vince until the numbers game catches up inevitably. It's just wrestler math. Um, so a few f crazy things happened that you wouldn't see nowadays. Um, Vince McMahon took a cameraman's camera wire, put it around Bobby Lashley's neck and just choked him. Like he literally fired Daniel Bryan for that. So you just, you wouldn't see that nowadays. So I found that pretty crazy. Another crazy part not even it wasn't crazy but i find it super hilarious shane looks at umaga and he's like pointing at bobby lashley and umaga's like not understanding what's going on and like shane's just like smash and then umaga just does a body splash really quick like that was hilarious so throughout the match they're focusing on bobby lashley's leg that's just the target. Um, and so they expose Bobby Lashley's knee to really sell the injury. And his knee was like incredibly ashy. Like that, it was just, I'll show it. Super ashy. Like, what are you doing, man? What are you doing? So Shane takes his classic elbow through the announce table bump. It was actually pretty cool, not gonna lie. I know Shane gets a lot of flack, deservingly so, but he is responsible for some of the most memorable spots in WWE history, and I'll always give him that credit. So the match kinda ends with Bobby Lashley overpowering everybody, and you could tell they were really, really trying their hardest to push Bobby Lashley, like no joke. So Lashley wins, and he's taking on that ECW championship. Now, the way they were pushing him, crazy. Like, you gotta remember just how much of a monster Umaga was and how much they were building him. And to see Bobby Lashley, like, towards the end of this feud, start to really just handle Umaga, it really just made him so much of a bigger deal than he could have been just facing just another guy, Joe Schmo. So I will credit WWE for trying to build another star in this time because they were really, they weren't lacking stars by any means. Like they had so many legends just going around, you know, carrying championships and like they, they were set as far as stars, but as far as the future, they weren't, this was the time they weren't really focused on building a future. Bobby Lashley was one of those guys that they did try and like push to the moon. And there were a few other guys and whether it worked out or not, they did try their hardest with Bobby Lashley, I would say. So I mentioned earlier that I didn't know Edge had a match later that night. And that's because after the Bobby Lashley match, the pay-per-view just cut off for me as a kid. Like I literally genuinely remember it as it just be that being the main event. And it made sense. He won the ECW championship. It's one night stand. I just took it as that. And I'm like, well, ECW is a shorter show. So maybe they would have a shorter pay-per-view. Fine. Play SmackDown versus Raw. Call it a night. But no, there was actually more to the show. There was Edge versus Batista. There was John Cena versus the Great Khali in a Falls Count Anywhere match. And then there was this next match. So we have Santino Marella and Maria in the backstage getting interviewed. And Candace Michelle interrupts and asks for a good luck kiss before her match. Her Divas Pudding match, to be exact. So Santino leans in for a kiss, obviously, because that's what you do when you're with your kayfabe girlfriend. You lean in to kiss another woman and Maria kisses her. Why did this segment need to happen? I'm just so, what are we doing? So then this brings us to the pudding match. All right. And I'm gonna just, I'm gonna just get it over with. All right. They were slipping and sliding and slipping and sliding and just slipping and, and Candace Michelle wins and 
You already know they needed to book women better. I didn't even have to do this. This was... All right, next match. So we have Edge versus Batista in a steel cage match. Now, around this time, Edge had beat Mr. Kennedy for his Mr. Money in the Bank match. Backstage politics got to Mr. Kennedy, so he lost his Money in the Bank opportunity. Kind of tough, because he was actually another star in the making that really could have helped him out in the future. But I digress. Batista wins a number one contenders match, and because these guys already have a heated rivalry going on, Teddy Long makes it a steel cage match. So one thing I wanted to note is that Edge had the Rated R logo next to his name on his nameplate. That's hard. I ain't even gonna lie, that's hard. I hated Edge at the time, but that's hard. So I'm not sure if other nameplates had that with the World Heavyweight Championship specifically, but regardless, any gear that I see, I'm just gonna shout it out because like the designers in WWE be snapping. I'm not gonna lie. They have come up with some of the greatest like just gear that I've ever seen. So I will definitely be pointing that out as we go. By the way, this match is commentated by Michael Cole and JBL. So I wanted to mute it. I didn't mute it. It's not even because of Michael Cole. It's more so because of JBL. I'm just not a fan of his heel yelling commentary. It's just not fun. So this match was actually pretty good. This was the first time I've seen this match. I've always seen the clips of it in like highlight packages and stuff like that, but I've never actually seen this match. I was always wondering when this match happened. And I guess it's because the whole second half of the pay-per-view for me was just not on the disc that I had. So I missed out. But watching it back, it was actually a pretty good match. There was a little bit of blood. Edge going face first into the cage. Had a bloody mouth. Just storytelling throughout. You know, Edge being a cowardly hill. But he always, he played that to the best like as far as as far as being a cowardly hill especially in this time like yes randy orton was like he was a better heel in my opinion just because i truly hated his guts just off of what he was doing but like edge was i would say the more successful heel he already had two title reigns two world heavyweight title reigns at that point so he was like really top one or top two heels they really could alternate depending on how despicable one of them were going to be each week Later on in the match, it's not really focused on, but Edge was wearing a thong that kind of got exposed. It wasn't like a focus or anything on the storyline, but it was kind of hard not to notice. So Edge wins the match. He lands feet first. This is that classic match where Edge lands feet first while Batista is trying to crawl out with his two hands. Um, a lot of Batista steel cage matches actually end like this, and I'm gonna take a look at those. But yeah, all in all, this was a good match. Like it wasn't. I don't really have anything negative to say about it. I really enjoyed it. Like Batista was literally one of my favorite baby faces. Like from 2005 all the way to even when he was. Batista, I was still kind of a fan. Like I, I really enjoyed Batista. I was never like, I was never, I never didn't like Batista. Like he was always cool to me. And then to end off the night, we have John Cena versus the Great Khali in a false count anywhere match. Now the Great Khali has always been pretty limited in the ring, but he was always a super imposing figure as far as like when he first started, just the path of destruction he would have. Like he literally juiced Rey Mysterio's head that one time. That was wild. Just like the palm strike he would do to people's heads. That was ridiculous. Like, and it was like a super over move as far as like how he was putting people away. So I think at this time, Kali was like, I don't think it was questionable. Are they going to make him champion? So you didn't really have anything to worry over John Cena at the time. But like, like, you were definitely like, what are they going to do with this guy? Because, like, eventually, he, you were building him to do something. So, in this match, like I said, Kali is pretty limited. So, it, it was a lot of beatdowns in the corner. And John Cena, like, running around him, you know, using the whole speed versus height advantage. So, um, it gets pretty hands-on in the crowd for a good chunk of it actually um these guys go through and i've actually again i've never seen this match before i've only seen clips of it so i saw the famous clip where you know kali gets hit in the face with the cam and the famous clip where cena gives him the attitude adjustment off the tractor onto like 
the platform below um so it was nice to see where that originated from because like i was always like when did that match happen and again turns out i watched the pay-per-view but just didn't see the ending so this was really good all in all it was a good trip down memory lane just watching this it definitely made me want to keep watching more just things of this era and of this um time period so leave some comments below like letting me know what type of forgotten but still good pay-per-views from like 2005 on to like 2010 just that five year gap of like super forgotten but super good pay-per-views let me know we can go through them together i had a blast doing this and i can't wait to do the next one also let me know in the comments um how you guys feel about a rating system maybe for each match like i really want to be more interactive with you guys and get your thoughts and opinions like maybe i say a match is a two and you can tell me it's a, a five i haven't figured out the rating system but we'll get there and and then we just talk about why you think that so i'll see you guys then and keep it kaze